Christopher. So hey, I want to remind you of a time. I want you to think of a time. A time where you believed you could not be stopped. For some, it may be when they were young and they were a monster breaking and destroying their sister's dollhouse. <laughs> was there ever a time where you, sorry, was there ever a time where you just had to keep on going? You believed you could not stop. Was there ever a time you believed everything was on the line? I think of Die Hard. There are people to be saved. For me, this was always basketball. I always thought of basketball when it came to this. Because when I played basketball, I gave my own. I gave 100% of everything I had. I believed I could not be stopped. Yeah. No one would take the ball from me. And if they did, I would sure get it back. When I was playing basketball, I took as much shots as I could because I believed if I missed a single shot or if I didn't make anything, I would lose. And losing was the biggest shame of my life. I went to my parents and I told them about every basketball game. And to tell them that I lost, man, even though it happens quite often, I was still ashamed. <laughs> I also think of skating. When I get yeah. a pair of roller skates on my feet, <laughs> and ice skates, it doesn't matter how many times I fall, I believe I cannot be stopped. I oh, get man. back up and I try and I try and I try. Oh, yeah. I just think of going as fast as I can. That's mainly why Murali let go of my, let's go of my hand. She says, go on your own first, because she doesn't want to go that fast. So hey, I want to ask you, do you see your Christian life like this? Mm. Something that can't be stopped. Something that shouldn't be stopped. Something that has everything on the line. Today, the title of my sermon comes from 2 Timothy chapter 1 and is Do not, don't be stopped. Wow. Point 1, don't be stopped by fear. It's 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you're, uh, I also sent out the lesson by email. If you're using your Bibles, it's all in the book of Timothy. Uh, 2 Timothy. So 2 Timothy chapter 1, it says from verse 3, I thank God. To my son, as my ancestors did, with a clear, clear conscience, as night and day I consistently remember you in my prayers, recalling your tears, I long to see you, so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you. For this reason I remind you to fan into the flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gives us does not make us timid, yeah. but gives us power, love, and discipline. Mm -hmm. And it's, this is an incredible part right here. Paul states that his conscience is clear. He has no clear conscience, and then he encourages Timothy to move on without fear. Were they being persecuted? What was going on at this time for them? Well. The second letter of Timothy was, is estimated to be written in the year 64 AD. And at this time, the Christians were already going through persecution. In this very same year, July 19th, there was a great fire of Rome. You can look it up, it's called the Great Fire of Rome. And it, uh, the flames went, uh, were going on for six days and seven nights. It took out 10 or 14 districts in Rome. There are many little theories as to how the fire started. But information shows that most it was all down to Nero. Nero wanted to rebuild Rome in his own design, in his own image. So after that, Nero wanted to take the blame off him. And unfortunately for our brothers and sisters at this time, the blame was easily put on the Christians. Why was this? At this time, the Christians were going through persecution. Uh, some of the persecution went because the Christians were atheists. We were atheists. To believe in one or no God. And in those times, there was a lot of emperor worship. The Christians refused to worship whatever emperor there was. Christians only worshipped Christ. And so the people didn't like that. There was also persecution against religious, uh, religious faith, religious belief. The exercising of our, our belief. Jesus says to eat the bread and drink the wine in remembrance of him. The bread, his body, and the wine, his blood. Unfortunately, rumors spread that the Christians ate their Lord. Half truths began to spring up. Because in this time, uh, unfortunately, there were many poor people. 40 to 40% 40 of Rome was either slave or, uh, or servants. And most of them were uh, in poverty. 
And so whenever a family had given birth to a baby girl or a disabled child, that child was thrown out onto the streets. For a boy can bring in money to look after their parents. And so the Christians with their good hearts went out onto the streets and took the children, taking them into their homes and adopting them into families. It was then said that the Christians were eating their children, adding fuel to the lie of candles. So people, I want you guys to know, people are going to persecute us. There is no doubt about it. People are talking about you right now. Some people are telling their friends about how they find it so annoying that Jessica, Sephora, and Douglas are out there on campus sharing their faith. <laughs> people are getting annoying. And it's simply because they don't like our conviction, they don't like your faith, and they don't love God. As Jesus says in John chapter 15, verse 18, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. Mm. So I want to encourage you guys, with this persecution, bring your gift to life. Paul here encourages Timothy to bring his gift to life. Even with the persecution and the accusations against the Christian faith, Paul still calls him to fan into fame his gift that God has given him. Paul reminds Timothy that there is a gift that God has given him. It is within him, and he needs to keep it alive. He needs to keep it going. This is the gift of the Holy Spirit. The power to speak in other known languages. The power to heal. And the power to prophesy. Though, all this, through all the, though with all this persecution, Paul wanted Timothy to be encouraged to continue preaching the word. His message to Timothy was don't let the, don't let the spirit be silenced. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 it says the spirit, of, the spirit God gave us does not make us timid mm. but gives us power, gives us love and it gives us self-discipline. The call to Timothy was to be strong and to put into action the spirit God has given us. Timothy was chosen for a reason. Paul chose Timothy for a reason. Paul called him to this because he believed in him. In verse 6 again, it says, For this reason I remind you to fan into the flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Paul is saying something to Timothy right here. He's saying, I laid my hands on you and gave you the gift of the Holy Spirit because I believe in you. He believed Timothy was going to do something for him. That it was worth being put into Timothy. During the time of Timothy's leadership, Ephesus had a population of 250,000 people. It was the base of all the slave trade. One of the most popular uses for, sh for slaves, though, was for sex. Paul believed that Timothy could make a difference no matter how bad the city was. So I want to ask you, do you believe you're going to do the same thing here in Auckland? Do you believe you're going to make the same difference? Paul encouraged Timothy to stay in Ephesus in his previous letter. And in this letter too, Paul encourages Timothy not to be silenced by fear. Not to be silenced, but to remain and to preach, teach, heal, and get, uh, and get things done. We are here too to make a difference. And if you guys really want to believe how much of a difference you're making already, I want you to look at Pascal. I've been giving Pascal a lot of praise this month. This month is uh, Pascal's month. <laughs> if you look at Pascal, Pascal has conviction. Pascal is determined. He has integrity. So far, being a Christian for two months, I'd say just about two months, two months or maybe less or just a small bit more, he's received persecution from his family, uh, saying that the church he's in is a cult, and still he stood firm. Still he stands strong. Come on, Kelly. He's received persecution from his friends, and still stands strong. If you guys want to know the difference you're making here in Auckland, the difference your conviction is making already, look at Pascal. Look at Tim. Look at these guys and believe in what we're doing. Mm. So. So in the Lord, sorry, so don't be stopped by fear. I encourage you, don't be stopped by fear to share your faith. Don't be stopped by fear and believe that you can't get your permanent residency. 
Mm. Wow. Come on. Don't be stopped by fear. I believe you can't save it. Mm. Come on, Chris. I want to encourage you guys. Use the gift God has given you and go after making a difference here in Auckland. Come on, Chris. Point number two. Don't be stopped by shame. Mm. In verse 8 it says, So don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me as prisoner. Grab up. Join in me, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Don't be ashamed of Christ. You would think that here Paul would simply tell Timothy to share his faith a little more. Taking pride in the gospel and the family of disciples meant, sorry, meant you would be at risk of suffering. You'd be at risk of being ashamed of something or being a source of shame. Walking down the road in Rome, if you ever interacted with a Roman soldier, you would walk up to him and to show loyalty to Rome, you would raise your hand in the air, and you would say, Hail, Hail Caesar. And this was a form of emperor worship. You are worshipping the emperor in this way. Though a Christian walking down the street wouldn't do this. A disciple walking down the street, there's, there's a story about how they would get a stick instead, I don't know where they would find a stick in the road, but and draw, draw a fish to be able to know who it's, who's a disciple and who's not. But a disciple wouldn't do this. A disciple instead will only worship Jesus. Though this was the least of the problems of the Christians. It was the very least. Already some of them were being killed for their faith. Paul himself, shown in the book of Acts, many years before he met Timothy, was someone who went around persecuting Christians. Who went around torturing Christians. Was, so, was someone that, sorry, was someone who punished the Christian faith, people because of the Christian faith. To suffer with Christ meant far more than it does today. Matthew died being dragged to pieces. A rope tied to a part of, to a limb of his body, the other end to a horse, and he dragged him until he was dead. Many Christians were covered in tar, tied to posts, and put up in Emperor Nero's garden and little fire to bring light to his garden. Many Christians were put in Colosseums, put there to, for entertainment, so people could watch them fight lions. Unfortunately, they weren't given any, uh, any weapons, and so it was more so a uh, slaughter that many people loved. Today, I'm personally happy that I'm not being led to the den of lions and being torn apart and eaten, but it doesn't mean the world's any better. Mm -hmm. To be ashamed of Christ is to be ashamed of the life we're living today. In verse 9, he says, He has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. We are here now because of what Christ did to us. It's great listening to Monica's communion and find out what Christ has done, to, done for her. Today we live our life because of Christ. And we get to see that change in people around us. The scriptures say, the scriptures say that we were saved by, uh, by Christ. If we are ashamed of Him, who saved us, how can we be grateful for the life He has given? A person who takes this life for granted and wants, uh, wants what they once had, not seeing what we have right now, what they have right now in its full value. The scriptures itself says, Jesus replied in Luke chapter 9, no one, who, no one who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. It's through the gospel, the life of Christ. The life that he lived and his sacrifice, that we live a new life right here today. And for this reason, we must not be ashamed of the gospel. For this reason, we've got to share our faith. For this reason, we've got to tell people about what we have. Yeah. I always think of the dark night when I think of someone who's ungrateful for the life they're living. I'm not sure if anyone's seen the dark night. I think it's one of the best movies, action mm -hmm. movies ever made. <laughs> but uh, it's Batman, basically. And Batman goes and uh, saves this guy, this guy called Harry. And he's a politician and Bruce Wayne believes he could do something in Gotham City. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, Harry didn't want to be saved. And unfortunately, yes, Batman didn't want to save him. He got the wrong address. 
But uh, he saves him instead of his girlfriend who he loves. And both of them, him and Harry, wanted her to be saved instead. But instead of Harry living his life once he was saved, he then chose to go out and kill as many people as he can so he can get Batman's attention and try to kill Batman himself. But for this reason, but we need to be grateful to Jesus. It's for this reason that we need to entrust our own lives to him. In verse 12 of chapter, uh, of chapter 1, still in Timothy 2, it okay. says, This is why I'm, su I'm suffering as I am. Yet, this is no cause for shame. Because I know whom I believe. I am convinced that he who is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. This is the reason Paul was suffering. This is the reason Paul gave his life. Not only that is that Paul says he, know, uh, he knows Christ. He began to know Christ. He began to understand his life. Paul understood temporary life of suffering for an eternal of glory in heaven. Strengthened by his relationship with God, Paul knew who Christ was. Paul knew his suffering. He didn't simply believe that he was sent from God. But that he came to show the world how to live. Paul grew knowing Christ and his life so that he entrusted Christ with his own. I think you guys all know an incredible example of this right here in the church and that is Monica. She came up here, she shared, and I'm going to give her a bit more praise, but Monica has been doing a great job at this, giving her life to Christ in many different ways. Not only did she give up her life in America with her broken down car, but she then went to Australia and she, she began to have tons and tons of friends in Australia. Yeah. She had a family in Australia. And she gave up Australia. She said, hey man, I'm going to let you guys go. You can stay in Australia. I'm going to come to New Zealand. So now Monica's here in New Zealand with us. I'm so happy to have her. But now Monica's going to Samoa. And she's going to do more in Samoa. And Maradi and I were talking about her. I mean, we talk about Monica and Pascal. They're like the ones that we talk about. Like, <laughs> we love you guys. And we'll talk about how we believe Monica's going to do incredible things. Yeah. yeah. We believe Monica's going through the short life of struggling, of suffering, of leaving her family behind and making new friends <coughs> everywhere she goes. Because she has a relationship with God above everything else. Yeah. Her relationship with God is what pushes her to keep on going. Come on. And we just need to go after our own relationships with God. Look after what Christ has entrusted to you also. It says, uh, 2 Timothy 1, 14, it says, Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. The deposit given to you is the truth, the gospel. God has given us the power we need to use it. How long will you suffer in order to look after? Do you already, have you already told yourself the limit you would go in your suffering? Have you already promised yourself that, hey, if, the, if I have to suffer to this point, I will stop? Mm -hmm. Or have you promised to Jesus that you'll go to whatever extent you need to go? Mm -hmm. Have you opened up your own doors to suffering so that others can hear the word? Christ had no limit. Along with Paul, who was beheaded for preaching the gospel. These guys had no limit. I want to challenge you guys. Look for your den of lions. Look for your post of tar and that flame. And take it. Sit on it. Put your head on the stool and have it cut off. Not literally, but uh, you get the expression. <laughs> I want you guys to, to live the life which you believe may lead to shame. But do it for Christ. Do it for the gospel. Do it because you believe in him. Mm. And lastly, don't be stopped by poor friendships. Yes, this is, a, this is one of Paul's points. As he says in verse, from verse 15, You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phygelarus and Hamagustus. Hamagustus. Uh, may the Lord show mercy on the, to the household of Phineas. Because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy 
from the Lord on that day. You know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. You need friends around you guys. Yeah. You need friends when you're facing fear. You need friends when you're going through suffering. You need people around you no matter the situation. People help you. I, I believe that's why Jesus did send out the 72 uh, in twos. He sent them out one by, uh, in twos so that one can have the help of the other. We need good friendships. Yeah. You need people and friends. Mm -hmm. Jesus needed the disciples and he expressed his need for them. But even though they left him, he still died with their salvation in mind. Once he was raised from the dead, they were the first people he saw. His faith in them set them up for greater things. And a few days after he left them, they baptized 3,000 people. Wow. Having a friend with you does give you faith does support you, it does build you up. How many people have you seen be stopped following God because someone else's, because of someone else's decision? Because someone else is following you? Paul was refreshed by his faithful friends. But Phineas was, was a person Paul was grateful for. The talks about how, uh, how he searched hard for Paul and many, uh, many times helped him. Though I think the biggest impact was that he was not ashamed of his chains. Make a friend, anyone. A disciple right here. The disciple, disciples had a limit and Paul too had a limit. There are, good re there are good reasons for Jesus to be ashamed in the disciples. There were good reasons for Athenians to be ashamed of Paul. When I say make a friend, I want to make a friend that you can see past their shame mm -hmm. and they can see past your shame oh, the your chain them looking past your chains and them looking past the reasons to desert you what power what, what is powerful about that uh, about these friendships is that it took one person to see past the other person's limits for them both to be strong mm -hmm. you can't live a christian life alone so go after making a friend right here that you will have He'll support you through your weaknesses. He'll support you through your fears. And support you through your times of shame. I love having the friendships I have right here. I love having Tim, Pascal, and Sean. These guys are incredible. One of my limits and weaknesses is basketball. Uh, I know nothing <laughs> about it. They see past that, so they, they find another reason to relate with me. Uh, another one of my another people another group of people I love is all of you guys. One of my weaknesses can be speaking it can be simply reading uh, every now and then but over the past few weeks of being able to grow in this i have seen you guys support me so much come on this this honestly has been something that i had been insecure about but with the help of you guys around me still say come on chris when <laughs> i have skipped i have buckled over a couple of words come on chris it's inspiring so helpful and i want to thank you guys for what you guys have done in my life you, I know that you guys are people who I believe will stay with me when I'm afraid, when I'm ashamed of something. And in the same way, I want us all to look towards one another. And even the guests out here today, look towards the people in this church right here, for people who will help you. And so, with this little challenge, go to the person you are least friends with and make them your closest friend. Mm -hmm. And so to conclude, to finish off, don't let the power of God be stopped by fear. Don't let the power of God be stopped by shame. And don't let the power of God be stopped by poor friendship. To God, glory. Come on.